Welcome, welcome, welcome. Mario Michel here. Today's topic Spiritual Influences and the Mind, part number six. Let's get right into it. Love of Jesus surrounds souls with fragrant atmosphere. And I believe we're going to end this chapter in part number six. I think so. So, I won't be commenting too much so the video doesn't get long. But I think we're going to end this chapter right here. The souls of those who love Jesus will be surrounded with a pure, fragrant atmosphere. There are those who hide their soul hunger. These will be greatly helped by a tender word or a kind remembrance. The heavenly gifts, freely and richly bestowed by God, are in turn to be freely bestowed by us upon all who come within the sphere of our influence. Thus, we reveal a love that is heaven-born and which will increase as it is freely used in blessing others. Thus we glorify God. Manuscript 17, 1899 So, whatever we get from God, we need to also give to other people. Um, if you think about it, the gift that we receive is to, is to, is to use for other people. It's not to keep it to ourselves, but it's for us to to use it so that others may be blessed by what God by what God has given to us, and that's how we can glorify God, is by doing His will. Moving on. Results of one moment of thoughtlessness. I think that's a main thing because we like to go to that what we call it empty box. <laughs> I guess that part was written for men specifically because only men can go to that empty box. Women cannot do that. They don't go to that because they're not wired like men. So let me see what that one said because that would be very interesting. Once if God removed from conscience uh, the indulgence of, of one evil habit, a single neglect of the high claims of duty, may be the beginning of a course of deception that will pass you into the ranks of those who are serving Satan while you are all the time professing to love God and His cause. A moment of thoughtlessness, a single misstep, may turn the whole current of your lives in the wrong direction. Testimony for the Church, Volume 5, page 398. Okay, so that's not what I was thinking of, but what is basically talking about is you not thinking straight. It's not that you're not thinking at all. You're not thinking straight. You're thinking in other terms. That's why it says that one misstep indulgence of one evil habit it's not just men that do that women women also have evil habits so i was thinking of you know when you as a man you just relax and you're not thinking about anything you're just in the in the zone and then let's say your girlfriend or a friend of, of yours which is a girl comes and says to you or your mom hey what are you thinking of? Nothing. You know? That drives them crazy. It drives them uh, 
not because we don't understand how we can just sit like this and then they ask us what we were thinking and we say nothing so that was my first reaction when I read the title but that's a different story to talk about right now so yes so this is a not a not thinking that we do but it's not thinking the right thing because once you start thinking something else that is not the right thing then you can miss you can take a miss a misstep you can do other thing basically so yes okay god works no miracle to prevent harvest oh the lord sends us warning counsel and reproof that we may have opportunity to correct our errors before they become second nature but if we refuse to be corrected god does not interfere to counteract the tendencies of our own course of action he works no miracle that the seed sown may not spring up and bear fruit he works no miracle that the seed sown may not spring up and bear fruit that men who manifest an infidel hardy work or is stolid indifference to divine truth is but reaping the harvest which he has himself sown such has been the experience of many they listen to stoical indifference to the truth which come, which once stirred their ver their very souls they sowed neglect and difference and resistance to the truth and such is the harvest which they reap the coldness of ice the hardness of iron the impenetrable unimpressible nature of rock all these find a counterpart in the character of many a professed christian it was thus that the lord hardened the heart of pharaoh god spoke to the egyptian king by the mouth of moses giving him the most striking evidence of his of divine power but the monarch stub stubbornly refused the light which would have brought him to repentance god did not send a, super a supernatural power to harden the heart of the rebellious king but as pharaoh resisted the truth the holy spirit was withdrawn and he was left to the darkness and unbelief which he had chosen by persistent rejection of the spirit's influence men cut themselves off from god he has in reverse no more potent agency to enlighten their minds no revelation of his will can reach them in their unbelief review and herald june 20 1882 and the title says god works no miracle to prevent harvest so you sow the good seed and you get the good harvest you sow the bad seed well you get the bad harvest that's how it works and um what we don't what we don't what we do need to realize is what we do need to realize is um people will assume that god likes to uh how was the word to harden people's heart god doesn't and if you think about it you can think of one time where you said to god um god if you do this for me i'll do that and so what does god do god does it for you and what do you do after that you don't keep your promise that's exactly what pharaoh was doing he said to moses go pray to your god so you can stop this 
and not let them go. And after Moses did pray, what did he do? When God removed the things, what did Pharaoh do? He did not release the Hebrews or the Israelites. And that's how Pharaoh hardened his heart. God didn't do it on purpose. God just was trying to show him that if he is not saved, it's because he chose not to be saved. Not because of God. Not because God did that. So, let's move on. We're almost done. Molding our surroundings instead of being molded by them. Ha! Molding our surroundings instead of being molded by them. I'm sure that we know what it means. I think, yes, there is a, I think in the, in the quarterly of this, of this year we started, one part is called to, to be eaten or to eat. Which one do you want? Do you want to mold your surrounding or do you want to be molded by your, by your surrounding? And as a Christian, you should never want to be molded by your surrounding unless it is according to God's principle. There are evils which men may lessen but can never remove. That is for sure. He is to overcome obstacles and make his surroundings instead of being molded by them. He has room to exercise his talents in bringing order and harmony out of confusion. In this work, he may have divine aid if he will claim it. He is not left to battle with temptations and trials in his own strength. Help has been laid upon one who is mighty. Jesus left the royal courts of heaven and suffered and died in the world degraded by sin that he might teach men how to pass through the trials of life and overcome its temptations. Here is a pattern for us. Testament for the Church, Volume 5, page 312. I think that one was pretty straightforward. So, moving on. God desires the mind to be renovated. The rubbish of questionable principles and practices is to be swept away. The Lord desires the mind to be renovated and the heart filled with the treasures of truth. Manuscript 24 1901 We are almost done. I've been saying that <laughs> with this chapter. To, de to deal judiciously with different minds. We all need to study character and manner that we may know how to deal judiciously with different minds that we may use our best endeavors to help them to a correct understanding of the Word of God and to a true Christian life. We should read the Bible with them and draw their minds away from temporal things to their eternal interests. It is the duty of God's children to be missionaries for Him, to become acquainted with those who need help, if one is staggering under temptation, his case should be taken up carefully and managed wisely, for his eternal interest is at stake, and the words and acts of those laboring for him may be a savor of life unto life, or of death or death unto death. Testimonies for the volume 4, page 69. Lastly, we have finally gotten to the end. After a long time, me saying it, saying that we are almost done. Unbending principle marks students of Jesus. Unbending principle will mark the course of those who sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of Him. 
Review and Hero, June 20, 1882. And I'm going to say this. I must say that something that the Pope said one time was, um, you are an extremist or a terrorist if you are unwilling to bend the principles, meaning Bible principles. And that was according to the Sabbath question. Yes, it's going to be the Sabbath question at the end anyway. So, if you are a follower of Christ and you are not willing to bend any principle, then you are a fundamentalist, which you actually call also a terrorist. So you are I'm basically, maybe, I'm probably basically a fundamentalist, a terrorist, an extremist, according to Pope Francis. Yes, I say it like that, which is true. That's what he said. So, um, let us remember that we don't live for people. We live for God. So if God did not bend any principle so we could be saved, then we shouldn't bend any principle either. So, that's why I'm going to end this chapter called um, Spiritual Inferences in the Mind. Uh, yeah, the chapter is, is done now. We, are, we have finished that chapter. So, um, thank you guys for watching. I hope to see you guys again. But um, if I don't see you guys again, I hope to see you again when Jesus Christ comes the second time. Of course, in heaven. Until then, bye for now. Mother out.